let's talk about it. Hello and welcome back to Thick Radio, the podcast where we talk about gaining, feedism, and everything in their orbit. I'm James. And I'm Tim, so let's get into it. Today we're welcoming to the show, we've got our good friend Izzy. Hello, hello. Glad to be here. Glad to have you here. How are you? Not too bad on this fine, warm day. How about y'all? Doing good. Doing all right. Doing all right. Today is, of course, another fun day for us here on the pod. We get to celebrate the anniversary of more iconic Gainer films. Uh, it's funny when you think about it, right? Because obviously we're looking at the nearest, like, uh, five-year integer within the podcasting timeline of, like, when we can celebrate a certain film. It's interesting that, like, kind of a number of films have come out in similar times of the year. Uh, just just interesting. Interesting that it, it, all, it all kind of uh, spends out that way. Today we're going to be talking about Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, which, you know, uh, I would say, because I'm, I'm 30-odd, early 30s, young and gorgeous, effervescent and beautiful, um, it's a little bit after my time in terms of an inspiration, but uh, we're going to be exploring what that means for different people today. So, Izzy, you ready to get into it, doll? Sure I am. Fabulous. Well, listen, first cab off the rank, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, what's the film about? All right. So, from, you know, like we said this week, we came out a bit ago. Uh, it's been some time since I've seen it in theatres. I've seen it a few other times since then. But the general synopsis, it takes place on this small island called Swallow Falls. Kind of focuses around the story of a main character named Flint, who is kind of down on his luck. He's a failing inventor who just really wants to make it big for his community. Kind of focuses on him focus making this, like, weather machine that makes food. So he kind of brings tourism back to a small island. They struggle a lot with tourism. They're, like, trying to figure out what's going to be the big thing that's going to drag all these people over here. And so this was his solution, but his project goes awry, it flies off to the sky, and everyone's like, oh no, he blew it again. But with the thing in the sky, it starts to malfunction, and then lo and behold, it starts with hamburgers. And now they're like, what's going on? And now it kind of starts this interesting tourism aspect where like, you know, we have this natural, quote unquote natural phenomena of food raining in the sky. So naturally, you know, that brings in foodies, that brings in tourists, you know, that's dragging an attraction. And the mayor of the town, who in the earlier in the movie was talking about his struggles with like running a failing town, he just wanted to put his name on the map. He just really wanted to make it big. So he took this as an opportunity. He's like, all right, we're gonna take this food thing into full swing, like food weather, that's gonna be our thing here now. So he's very gung ho about it. He starts marketing it. He even changes the name of the town to Chew and Swallow. Kind of like a nice little food pun there to kind of have bring in those people. So as the movie progresses, we kind of see what's life like on the island with all the people living in this new weather area. And, you know, people love it. They get all the food they want. Um, you know, there's the feeder aspect that we start to see of just kind of like all this unlimited food. Food is falling from the sky. Everyone's so happy. And then we kind of start seeing the opposite side of it now where people are like, oh, like, it's just too much now. Like, you know, I can't handle it. And like, we just want to break. And then the machine starts to malfunction more. So now the food's getting bigger and then it starts destroying the town. So now Flynn and his gang are like, we have to shut off this machine. Like, this is going to destroy the town. And then we see the mayor of the town again. But now he is quite engorged he is literally on a little rascal scooter because he can't even walk anymore because of how much he's been eating the food and it kind of plays into this idea of how he wants to be you know something big where he even physically becomes something big and he talks about he's like we can't shut off the machine like we're finally getting popular like this is this is what i've been waiting for so they have a battle with flynn who then breaks like the machine that's supposed to cancel that's supposed to like turn off the weather machine so, and then the Flynn and the gang had to find out another way how to destroy the machine. And in the end, they do end up destroying the machine. All things go back to normal. And it's kind of a hunky-dory day. That's just kind of the rough general synopsis that I can remember from my mind. I love it. You remembered far more details than I did. Like, what's the name of this guy? I don't know. I don't know. 
but no, love it. That, that was a good synopsis there. Um, so Tim, yes. what was your impression of the film when you <laughs> first saw it? Oh, I don't remember the first time I saw this. Like apparently it came out in 2009. I would have been about 26 and I probably didn't see it in theaters. It's probably something that I caught on streaming at some point. I thought it was a cute film. Um, like like you said, James, I was a bit past the point. <laughs> I was way past the point where it was something of an inspiration um, like it would be for younger people. I mean, obviously I noticed that the mayor kept getting fatter and fatter and fatter um, and the clothes kept getting tighter and tighter. I don't think that we got any button pops throughout the film, though. I don't remember any. Yeah, not quite any of those salacious moments, but, you know, I, I love a foreshadowing of Nikocado Avocado. You know, I thought that was quite impressive that they were able to capture that in 3D animation. Um, but, yeah, it's interesting to think about films that, you know, for us don't have a, a root in childhood. They have a root in adulthood. And therefore, you know, maybe they don't, have the same kind of impact as us. I mean, Izzy, what was the impact like for you personally with this film? So personally, I was kind of entering, I was still about like, I'd say 15-ish around the time. So, you know, kind of already past my pubescent era of discovering kind of what slowly I was being more sexually interested in. Um, I consider myself kind of my gaining awakening and my awakening to theaterism in general to be in usually like around the 13 era when I was kind of more searching for things online. So. I wouldn't necessarily say this movie was a formative aspect in the shaping of kind of what I was discovering growing up, but it definitely was something more that kind of almost I was picking up a lot more. Like, obviously, to the civilian eye, they see this movie and they're like, haha, that's a funny bit in the movie. But as someone who, you know, is into this and knows more context behind the smaller nuances, I'm like, okay, like, I can kind of see how this is more attractive to me. Obviously, my my eyes were always looking for him on the screen, so it kind of shows how, like, as you're getting older, you start noticing these things more, and then you kind of start figuring out, you're like, okay, like, I know I like this to an extent, and then you kind of start building up more what that means for you as a person. So, pertaining to this movie, you know, he literally would force feed himself, and he would start literally shoving food because all he wanted to do was to be big. And the ironic twist is that not only was he big as a chorus detraction, but he was big physically. So that kind of plays on that little nuance of uh, metaphorically, how it metaphorically kind of plays into his physical and societal. I like that. I mean, curiously, because you mentioned, you know, maybe you first started to really notice things when you were more like 13 and that kind of an age bracket. Was there anything that like stood out to you at the time? Any like TV shows or films, even if it wasn't like in theaters at that age, just like things that you know like the dvd that the family had or you know you went over a friend's house for a sleepover and it happened to be on tv or something like that what kind of films and tv shows really took your interest at the time when it came to gaining and growth and size and fat and all of that definitely cartoons i feel like kind of the younger generation of cartoons will say like before i did, I don't go up and say younger cartoons younger to me exactly you know like early 2000s late 90s a lot of that cartoons was much more animation style was like very like 2D cartoon, very kind of focused on transformation as like a comedy aspect. So, you know, if someone would grow or shrink or get stretched out or inflated or shrink, kind of was used more as like a comedic aspect. Um, I guess the biggest thing that I can think of would be like Scooby-Doo, you know, with Shaggy and Scooby, they'd always have the like little one-off scenes of them finding a cafeteria and they're like, oh man, we were running away from the zombie, but we got a bite to eat. And then they literally gorge themselves to the point where they're like twice the size of a beach ball just laying on the ground. And then just like, oh man, that was so good. And just scenes like that, I'd be like, huh, I don't know why I'm like particularly interested in this, but I'm, I'm going to keep looking at it. And then and there are other cartoons. And there's this one that sticks out to me personally, and I'm not sure if that everyone else can relate. But do you ever remember like an animated Winnie the Pooh series? Like after like the show, like the movie came out, and then there's kind of like a little one, I think it's like, Winnie the Pooh Adventures or Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, Winnie the Pooh, the new adventures. Mm -hmm. The new adventures, yeah. They introduced the Heffalumps as a character there. Because before in like the books and the show and the movie, it was like this scary monster that we never actually see. But in the show, they introduced them as characters. I think it's like a small family. But there's a one particular scene where the Heffalump, kind of like an elephant shaped Heffalump, like starts drinking up water and you literally see him blow up like a water balloon and you 
actually like see the water inside of him. And that is probably the earliest memory that I have about the, the earliest memory that I have of feeling something when I saw that. You know, I was way too young to understand what it meant. I was way too young to be like, I should ask questions about this. It was just kind of much more of like a, huh. Like the, the first huh moment that I really had kind of slowly turning the gears of what it, that's meant to me identity-wise as a feeder gainer, etc. It's interesting you mentioned that. and I, I, Funnily enough, in all the time we've done this series, Tim, I don't know if you can remember this, but I don't feel like anyone's ever referenced Winnie the Pooh as like the origin point for that fascination. I've noticed a few gainers, but they're usually older, like my age or even older, tend to use that as a reference because they would have been children around the time that the because the film version from Disney, I think, was in the late 60s. Yeah, like the OG, the actual OG one. And it's interesting because obviously that film was just like the vignette of like a couple of different Winnie the Pooh stories. And one of the first is... He's stuck his head through rabbit's hole. Calm people. <laughs> um, he's he's stuck his head through the rabbit hole, people, <laughs> um, and then gorged himself and is now stuck. And quite literally, he's is unable to get out until he has been there so long that he has starved himself <laughs> to lose the weight to get back out again. And then I'm pretty sure in the next scene, just like goes through he just gets time. restuck he just gets restuck in something he he gets blasted out of rabbit's hole <laughs> <laughs> and he, he lands in another hole <laughs> and gopher falls down his own hole <laughs> this see people this in case you were wondering bears and chubs listening why you can't find a winnie the pooh just plain red crop top anywhere it's because dizzy knows that y'all are nasty okay <laughs> Disney knows. <laughs> Disney's like, no, came up. They're not. They're not stupid. <laughs> Speaking of which, do you guys know about the Disney Vault? Yeah, you do. Yeah. Izzy, have you heard of this? Uh, I need more context on it. Tim, explain the Disney Vault. Children, if you don't know... The way that it's been explained to me is that the vault is like that thing where, you know how they say, oh, it's coming out of the vault for the first time in such and such years. It's like they have this marketing scheme where they will take films and they would put them in the vault so that they would be harder to find and then they would like re-release them and they'd make more money the second time around. But now that everything is on Disney Plus, I don't know if the vault is still No, no, it's a thing. So what, okay. So to be clear here, maybe the, maybe the vault in reference to like just the back end storage of all their classic films, maybe that's something, right? Okay, but, that's what they used to call it. They would say, "Oh, it's coming out of the vault," and like oh no, for like, a limited time. That that phrasing does still exist, but more specifically, yeah. the Disney Vault is a reference to an actual location. I'm not sure at which studio. I'm not sure, you know, how much physical space versus digital space it is, but essentially. Disney buys up all the porn that gets made of Disney characters because... Oh, okay, and like hides it away because they don't want it in the market. Okay. Yes. So there is... That I didn't know. There is very much a place, a space, a hard drive. I don't know how many terabytes of data, but basically they sue artists and they get the rights to their creations because it's like, oh... You created a likeness of our image. We decided that this goes a little bit too beyond the narrative of it. We are Disney. We are known as family friendly. What you have done with this character is not family friendly. Therefore, we have the right to buy it, snatch it, stash it away, do what we like with it. You are now no longer allowed to do what you were doing with this character. So there is a vault somewhere just filled to the brim with Disney porn. And if anyone. And Song of, and song of the Cell. <laughs> and if anyone has any links. Please feel free to reach out to us at thethickradio at gmail.com. We'd love to have a gander. Um, <clears throat> but that's Disney for you. Thinking more about Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. I mean, it is interesting to reflect on this mayor and this character who, as you say, like, he didn't walk into obesity as a struggle. He didn't even seem to challenge it. He was just like, nope, I'm just going to eat. This is what our town's about now and I got to represent. And, you know... There is something very sexy when I rewatched it. There is something very sexy about a fat character who's just like, yeah, this this is it. 
you know? It's, it's a confidence, I think, really speaks, which contrasts to a lot of these films. You know, Tim, having reviewed a couple of these now, it's interesting. So many of these characters, like it's an unintentional thing. It's accidental. Oh, no, I tripped and all of a sudden I'm fat and I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. Whereas this mayor, like, had things gone his way to this day, he would still be sat in his office, 20 billion pounds heavy, just eaten, marketing his fat ass, marketing his town. And like... Do either of you ever see other references like that, where we see a character who is so, like, just leaning into the fatness that they have? It's like not as prevalent, because I think what we see a lot in, like, at least in what I've seen more in recent media is, and kind of as a known idea, is that fat is always usually coincided with evil or villains or usually something that is not good. So to see a character portrayed who kind of embraces it and kind of, like you said, kind of makes it sexy, like it's in a weird way alluring. Because usually you always see fat characters always conniving or evil or it's seen as obesity as a sin. So to kind of shift that focus to see more characters like that, it's almost more interesting. Because you're like, okay, they're not just being used as the typical trope where fat equates to evil. You're like, okay, this is just more of a quality in this character. This isn't something that necessarily is defining, like, their motive or their striving, their plot line. It's just something about them, and then they have the overarching theme. I don't see that personally as much anymore, but I feel like it was probably even less so earlier on. In media. I can't think of any examples off the top of my head. Yeah. I know, I know we've talked about this briefly uh, recently, Tim. I feel like Shrek is perhaps one of the few fat positive male role models. And yeah. fat positive in the sense that, you know, his storyline is not ever really about his weight. And he's allowed and given space to have romance and go on an adventure and fight a dragon and do all this. And his weight is never like a hindrance. He's always able to just do the thing because... Well, he exists, he's in a body, he has to go and do the thing. Which, yeah, kind of incredible. And, you know, in a way, that confidence is inspirational. I mean, I know in the context of the film, he ends up being the bad guy. He's the one who pulls the trigger in the end, makes the whole machine go crazy. But, you know, you got to give up to a guy who's got the confidence to really, you know, put himself out there and, and showcase out of himself. Thinking a bit more broadly, you know, when we review these types of films and we're talking about gainer inspirations, in your opinion is, like, how important are these films to the sort of genesis of the gainer journey? I would say they're pretty, they're pretty important because as we've all, you know, you ask anybody in this community, like, you know, what, what was the thing that really kind of awakened you? What was the thing that really kind of made you be like, this is, you know, this is what I want. This is what applied to me. And most of the times, you know, They'll probably tell you the Santa Claus. That's usually kind of the most common answer that we see. But most of the time, there's also a lot of people that give you really different answers. And it's like, whether that's cartoons, uh, TV shows, like even like award-winning films you can even see. And even, for example, like the Wonka movie. The Wonka movie just came out and they have a very obvious subplot about a corrupt cop that gains weight. And you see him literally put on like 200 pounds in the film. And, you know, as we we're saying, like, you know, from older movies to more recent movies, every movie that you see that has some sort of gainer image, some sort of gainer image, is probably an awakening for somebody. And it's something that, you, you know, at people who are more seasoned, folks who have been in the community for a really long time, maybe don't notice it as much or kind of just think, oh, yeah, like, that's kind of hot. But some of these films are formative experiences. And I do think those are very important to reflect on and to kind of almost see how that shapes you, you know, for other people in the community, whether that's like gainers, bloaters, inflators, you know, you name it. Whatever that, like, you know, that titular movie was probably shaped them to what their identity was. In the mm. Tim, what about you? I mean, obviously we talk about this, you know, every, every anniversary review episode, but like, considering how much you and I have explored a lot of like people's journeys and gaining and all this over the years, like, do you feel like there is something truly like, not to say required in watching a film to be inspired, but do you feel like there is like a commonality in being inspired by specifically films that we see when we're younger? Do you feel like that is just part of the game of narrative? 
Yeah, I mean, I, and I, I have to assume it's the same for anyone who develops a fetish kink or or some kind of alternate sexuality. It's 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 it comes from somewhere, you know. Um, like I, obviously, being a part of it, being queer is not something that you've chosen, and it's not a result of something that you've been exposed to. But fetishes and kinks, I think most psychologists have said, is something that you're exposed to at a really young age, and it could be damn near anything, and then it evolves into something as puberty hits. So yeah, of course. I mean, I have my sources too. Yeah, I think when I, you know, what, what I was saying before about, you know, you don't get to see a lot of characters in power. I do think that that is maybe what we respond to when we see these movies. We respond to the Genesis arc of something that we intrinsically want to see reflected. And, you know, I think for anyone who is inspired by Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, inspired by this character, we're probably going to see a gainer archetype spring up as well. You know, I think a lot of people who are inspired by the Santa Claus tend to be heavily into Christmas, tend to be the Christmas gays who are super keen to portray Santa in the office pageant or doing whatever. Same thing with Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. I think people who were inspired by this as their genesis point are probably going to come across, you know, in their, I don't know, the gain of role plays is more, you know, that confident and almost arrogant archetype of fatty, you know, because that's inspired by that character. And I think it's important to recognize these reference points because it informs who we are and where we come from because we don't see it anywhere else, you know? Like, I do wonder you know, if, if fat positivity, let's say, not even gaining, just fat positivity, if that was commonplace on TV, I wonder what our reference points would be like, or if people would even have such a, a specific genesis, if people would just be like, yeah, I just saw fat people on TV all the time growing up and didn't even think twice, you know? I mean, to that point, how do you guys interpret fat characters on TV these days? Do you think it's improved since when you were younger or how's that looking? I think it's worse for anything that's aimed at adults. For children, it's still a free-for-all. Hmm. Yeah, I feel like with the for cartoons and for children too, it's like, it seems like there's more like loose seriousness for cartoons because, you know, usually adults looking at talk to cartoons or like, you know, it's just entertainment for kids. Like sometimes there's a life lesson involved, but usually the characters can look like whatever. Half the time characters are weird inanimate blobs. You know, they might not even reference a person or an animal. So I would say for sure. But it, from what I, at least I noticed, I feel like the fat positivity movement in general has definitely been going on for some time now for sure but you see a lot more of it in general on media and i feel like there is a bit more of an acceptance for you know fat folks in general like as we see like you know like lizzo sam smith not saying like they are the pioneers necessarily but those are some of the really popular ones that you see that are advocating for them and kind of seeing them be more unapologetic about it and you know getting a lot of backlash for for people who are like yo like, like why are you, you know, glorifying obesity like how, how dare you when you know it's just, we're just trying to be positive. We're trying to see a lot more of it. And I do agree, like, it might not be necessarily better, but it's being more aware and more brought up. There's more of the conversation. So it might not be exactly where everyone wants to be right now. But, you know, the conversation is happening. Mm. Well, and that whole thing where, like, how dare you promote obesity thing. You know what? I, if I want to promote obesity, I damn well can. I can promote any fucking thing I want to in a free country with a free fucking market. And if there are, you know, literal Nazis who have um, newsletters that they put out to, to you know, their communities and shit like that, you know, and like just the most disgusting and hateful shit gets said all over um, CNN and ABC, like all the TV stations, all the radio stations, I can promote fucking obesity. Fuck you for telling me that I should be ashamed of that. This is capitalism. Also, don't be <laughs> mad about the promoting of obesity because the obesity rates keep going up. So don't be mad at us for not promoting the obesity that we're not promoting. Be mad at like the general world population because clearly they want a piece of that fat fucking pie. Like, but something you said there, Izzy, really stuck a chord with me. The whole thing of, you know, these kids' cartoons, like, they're not serious, that they are fun. And honestly, I think that's kind of the answer. Like, why do we glean to these things? Because it's fun. Like, obesity yeah. as presented in any kind of adult media looks miserable and problematic. But when you look at, you know characters who become fat even if it's for comedic purposes you know you see them bouncing around you hear the boing boing sound effect you know it's all kind of jokey and comedic 
I suppose as kids, you don't necessarily know that that's a implicit shameful thing. You might see that as like, oh, they're bouncing around because they're having a fun time. And maybe you resonate with these characters because the transformation from thin to fat sees a sense of that joy. I mean, again, Santa Claus makes perfect, perfect sense. The fat, jovial man, the mayor of the town, you know, he's confident and he is far more powerful and imposing of a figure because of his size. And you see that shift in the film. It's demonstrative that the bigger you get, the closer to power, the closer to strength that you can become. I mean, I know you said is that, you know, maybe this film came a little after your time of inspiration, but do you feel like how the mayor does what he does? Do you feel like that has influenced your personal approach to, to feeding yourself, feeding other people, what you like to see in gain of porn? Like speak to that a little bit. Oh yeah, for sure. It definitely had a big influence on that. It was like in the in the movie, the mayor is always seen having food in his hand. He's always shoving food in his mouth, and as you see him, he does first get bigger, get bigger until he literally can't walk his own. So you know the idea of force feeding and even just like like autonomously force feeding is really hot for me. Like you know, like I consider myself a gainer and a feeder. You know, I like to kind of do both sides of it. Um, but I kind of always like to have a bit more control. So I feel like that kind of supported the sense in me of like, as yeah, that power, that hotness, like the authority figure of just being like, like, yeah, I'm here. I'm going to just eat whatever I want. And you're just going to have to deal with it. I'm like, I, I like that. Just kind of seeing like the confidence too, of like the confidence just of shoving it in your mouth. And you're like, he, like, he makes like maybe one offhand comment in the movie about his size. But like, he's just like, you know, I'm just getting big and he's just eating. And I'm like, I like that. Like, you're just so confident. You don't care what other people think. Like, you are, you're on a mission, bud. And I'm here for that. What about for you, Tim? Like, when you reflect on, you know, the mayor from this film, but also other films, do you feel like the way that you approach either your games or the way that you like to feed or have, like, kind of role-play sexy times, do you feel like any of those elements have maybe been informed by how you've seen other characters represent themselves on TV and in film? No, I mean, not necessarily in animated form, but in, um, you know, just bigger actors in film and television. Yeah, I would I would I would say that like I wasn't looking at them back then and thinking it because I didn't really come into my own as a gainer until I hit my late 30s. So by that point, I was looking at sort of celebrities and actors and, you know, the bigger guys and thinking like, that's what I'm trying to achieve. That's what I'd like to look like. So when I think about my own gaining journey and a lot of those inspirations, I mean, I do come back to the Santa Claus and I think, you know, again, there's a, there's a kind of childlike innocence. There is a thing of, this is a full grown man who basically goes from being a corporate chill to being happy and just, you know, just snacking on food. And, you know, it's not even that you see him eating a lot of the time. You do see him sometimes with like the whole stereotypical milk and cookies moment, but for the most part, he's just fat and bouncy, you know, kind of, and it is interesting seeing Tim Allen portray that character because he kind of like has a little moment like, oh, and then kind of full body turns and then has a little bit of a, the waddle is a little bit more left to right, I guess, in a typical fat person waddle. And you do kind of pick up on those tones. Um, but also in terms of fat inspiration, I look at people or characters, I, sh I should say, uh, like Uncle Iroh from Avatar The Last Airbender. You know, as a character, he obviously in the beginning of the show, it's not that he looks weak, but obviously he's portrayed as the fuddy duddy uncle, you know, silly man. But then as the show goes on, you realize how powerful he is. And he does have a moment, you know, in the third season where he trims down a little bit. Um, there's obviously contextual reasons for that. But even when he's at his biggest, you know, he's never weak. There are plenty of moments where it is Uncle Iroh that saves the day. And sometimes he saves the day by being physically powerful. Sometimes he saves the day by being emotionally powerful. And I appreciate that kind of a character dynamic where there is speaking in leadership positions, but then there is also speaking in the quiet when you need to have that more quiet confidence. Uh, and then there's a moment in season two after Azula goes crazy, where he's like, was with Zuko, he's all like, I know, Uncle, you're going to tell me that I should respect her because she's family. He's like, no, nah, I was going to say she's crazy. But you need to take her down. Like, also, the, the calm realist. I, I like that kind of diversity of thought behind a character. I would say since we're kind of on the topic of media, like, I, I'm someone who really enjoys media. You know, I like movies, TV shows, music, all that sort. So, you know, like anybody, you always like to see representation. You always like to kind of see yourself in the so, you know, 
as just myself in general, I always like to see like movies with characters that I can relate to, like on an emotional level, um, just kind of understand how they think and how that relates to me. And it kind of helps me, you know, understand who I am. So as we're on the topic of finding films with kind of the inner motifs, it's something that also kind of helped shape me and kind of helped me, you know, feel more confident as we're saying, like seeing, seeing bigger people portrayed in a more confident manner and not as a degrading manner kind of helped build me the confidence. Like, okay, you know, like this is somebody who is getting a lot of attention and it's, you know, they're looking at their character. They're looking at their story. They're looking at their humor. You know, they're just looking more than just a physical aspect. And I know there's the conversation of like, you know, the people who like to be pointed out for how they are. There's people who really, really like you know, the teaser aspect. Of it. Um, you know, I'm someone who I respect that, but I'm someone who kind of likes to be like, you know, there's my moments where I like want you to call me fat, but there's also a lot of moments where I'm like, I just kind of want you to like see me as a person at the same time. So I feel like seeing movies with bigger people portrayed just as humans kind of you know, makes me feel more confident about my growth. Where it's like, you know, I can see myself getting bigger in a society like this where I know I won't be treated as different. Unfortunately, larger people do get seen differently in modernizing society as it goes into a lot of like quote unquote beauty standards. Like and so, you know, just seeing pitch like little pics of media like this just kind of give me hope, you know, someone who's, you know, discovering themselves in this community and being, you know, hopefully they feel like they're more comfortable coming out into a world now where they're like, you know, like I don't feel like I'm as scared or hopefully, you know, they feel like they can kind of cultivate that community, knowing that there are people out there and knowing that it's okay, you know, to be proud of them. I mean, Tim, I, I know in our personal conversations, you, you'd love to reference uh, old Hollywood cinema and you'd love to reference these kind of media moments from like when you were growing up and those inspirations. I mean, what is fat representation like in that kind of an era? Is there much of it or is it just kind of not even not even shown? I mean, in the classic era, no, there really weren't a ton of um, large people in films. And if there were, then they were a villain or they were a fop or they were a um, another trope that is often used in film. You know, it was never, never a lead, never romantic. Um, and then when I was growing up, it was kind of the same thing. I mean, fat again became a comic relief thing. Um, even ch uh, children's shows, like I watched all that when I was a kid. And um, uh, Keenan Thompson, is that his name? The guy that's on SNL now, like he was, he was a um, a bigger kid. And there was also Lori Beth Denberg. She was bigger. Uh, and they were like the two big comedians in, in that cast. Like, and I think they were the two that went on to have the longest careers. So, yeah, it was very much an era of fat is funny. Fat guy is going to do fat things. You know, sometimes it was also mixed up with gross out humor. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was very the 90s. It was just like loud and in your face and like that infamous um, Yoshi's Island commercial is from the 90s. Yeah, it's interesting when you think about these um, media moments growing up and the, the the opinion it gives you of things. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of conversation around the representation of race and disabilities, gender and trans narratives in the media, um, which I know we would have plugged this uh, during our initial trans episode with... Uh, with Ray, but if anyone has not seen the movie uh, Disclosure, I believe it's still on Netflix, a fabulous documentary exploring the trans uh, representation in media over the years. And I'd like to see something similar for fat people. You know, I'd love to see that explored because when I think about powerful fat characters, good, bad, or ugly, Ursula comes top of the heap for me. And you just don't get a lot of characters with as much personality and the space they take up you know and again i come back to that point with the evil mayor you know yes he's the bad guy for the sake of the film but ultimately he represents power behind the weight and power behind the ambition and that ambition can also include fatness which you know now being a 30 something working in corporate london um you don't see a lot of fat people in corporate london and a lot of fat people are really kept out of that because stats show that people are less likely to get promotions less likely to get hired to see suite level jobs so it is nice to see that kind of representation take place i mean if i can ask you here is what would you want to see out of a future film that maybe would inspire the next generation of gainers definitely i would say just kind of focusing just on just having fat identity out there you know kind of like as we're seeing like or just, unfortunately, typecasting is very real, especially for fatter folks. You know, 
as you were saying, Tim, like they're usually more of the scapegoat. They're usually more of the funny character. They're usually just more of kind of a write-off joke. So hopefully kind of seeing more of a shift away from that, and especially for like younger folks, like the cartoons or like movies geared towards teens and younger kids. Like something that just shows, you know, fatter people in a kind of better light, you know, have them maybe be a lead or supporting role and not having the supporting role just be a comic relief or, you know, just seeing the visuals of that and not, you know, animating them in a human, like just just a human, like a humorous way, like animating them in a way where, you know, they're, they're confident, they're proud, you know, showing something that you can look like this and you can be happy with it. Like, you know, it's not just written off as like, like, oh, look, character XYZ is getting another plate from lunch and like, you know, just drawing like the negative attention to how they look. So seeing something written more in the light that, like I always say, like focuses on the story that kind of focuses more on the theme of what the, the show or the movie or whatever is being portrayed and just having that character as a representation of that story. But, you know, just showing diversity in general and just showing that it's good and how important it is to see that diversity whether that's body weight and anything else, is very important for children. And, you know, even just outside of gainerism and all that jazz, just in general, you know, just any folks who are large, you know, seeing that can really build up confidence and just help you kind of figure out life as you get older. What about for you, Tim? What do you want to see out of a gainer inspirational film of such a nature? I mean, as much as it would be kind of nice to see a, a more salacious gainer story on film, um, I know that's probably not going to help anything. Um, so yeah, it would it would probably be it would need to be um, protagonist that happens to be fat, but nothing about the story is wrapped up in the, in their weight or it, it you know it's not involving some kind of like weight loss journey or even thinly veiled as a we think you should get healthy kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I can't lie. I would like to see maybe in a comedy, you know, like a raunchy comedy, like a, a very salacious gainer feeder scene, you know, just because I'm a dirty old man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, I would love to see something queer. You know, I think something that you often find is that everything has to pass through the lens of being in the majority first. In order to find fat acceptance, we have to show it being white, cisgendered, straight, an appropriate amount of beauty norms perceived with both parties. Whereas I don't know, I'd, I'd love to see a chubby, a chubby boy, chubby little boy having a crush on another little boy, you know, a little bit, a little bit like what Luca was in a sense. Cause I know oh, a lot okay. of people, cause I know a lot of people were like, oh, it's not really a gay thing. I'm sat there like a faggot. Like that's <clears throat> this gay coded bitch. I'm sorry. <laughs> this, this is exactly are, 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 how is it not gay? That's the argument. That's the question I have for people. It's like, how, explain, like, explain the story to me and tell me how this isn't gay. <laughs> so what was that thing at Pompeii? They saw like two men cut, like literally spooning while they died. And anthropologists like, you know, the best we can work out is that they were roommates. They were they were just really good friends, is what history tells us. Yes, yeah, and so were um, uh, Alexander and Hephaestion and um, uh, Achilles and Patroclus. They were just really good friends. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No such thing as homosexuality in the past. It's all a new invention, and everyone's a liar. Um, so you know, I would love to see something genuinely like queer and cute and nice that can just just be lovely. So fat Luca basically give me give me that give me a very cute story that we can all watch and be like oh isn't this lovely warms the cockles of my cold dead heart because romance <laughs> ain't happening um and well, then, i already told you what film did that for me and i had nothing to do with that people <laughs> no red white and royal blue i just listen <laughs> Listen, Linda, I'm not judging. You know, there was a reason why I avoided that film for so long. I was like, because a part of me knew that I might end up actually liking it. And I was, that's what I was afraid of. Shake my damn head. Have you seen Red, White, and Royal Blue, Izzy? Uh, I just started it. I was watching it with my partner. Um, we definitely need to finish it. I was like, you know, whenever I see like the, the cheesy rom um, queer LGBTQ shows, I'm just kind of like, like, I don't know. Like, I'm not one for like, super tacky or like super on the nose kind of stuff but i will admit it was very cute and you know both lead actors are quite conventionally attractive they are that's what i good. said that's what i said i was like i normally detest cheap sentiment but for some reason this bullshit is is plucking the strings of my heart 
Listen, it, it snatched a lot of people. I know that much. Um, but yeah. Just like how important it is to have fat representation in film or cartoons. And like, you know, to the civilian eye, they might not bat an eye. And, you know, but these are things that are important to us. And these are things that I can say, you know, were formative of my sexual identity. I think they really helped me trying to figure out things and kind of helped start that conversation to realize that I am not alone in this. Like, you know, I am not the only weird guy that thinks fat people are attractive. And, you know, when you're younger, you just want to find that community. You just kind of want to find, you just want to make sense of these things. So I think it is just really important to see, you know, not like an influx of, I mean, as much as we would love, like an influx of fat films or fat comedy films, just to talk about it and just to have that conversation happen. You know, like this is important, and I think this representation is really good. And, you know, maybe they should have maybe more raunchy rom com versions or more cutesy versions. Well, speaking to that real quick, if people have not watched Survival of the Thickest, written, directed, and or written and directed by, and also starring Michelle Buteau on Netflix, I'm going to strongly recommend it. Tim and I watched this together when uh, I was in Florida. And, you know, it's got to be the first time I see two fatties fucking on TV. Like, it was fabulous. You had a, a big old man going down on her puss, and it's like, this may not be gay sex, but it's fat sex. I saw her thighs, I saw her thighs wibble wabbling up in the air. I was like, bitch, you better, you better jiggle, bitch. You better have a good old fucking time. It was glorious. But I think that actually brings us to the end of today's conversation. So, Izzy, thank you so so much for being here today it's been a pleasure thank you glad to be here thanks for the opportunity of course now where can our listeners find you online uh you can find me on my gangsta at ellie underscore duval i am also on grammar under the username sayonara wild hearts fantastic well that's it for another week here on thick radio please remember to like and subscribe rate us five stars and leave us a good review now if you liked this episode the podcast or just us in general please share it with your friends and encourage them to tune in you can find me on instagram and blue sky at stanham and you can find me on instagram twitter youtube and tiktok at thicky mouse you can also look us up on instagram youtube and tiktok at thick radio or at our website at podpage.com forward slash thick radio if you want to submit a voice note or become a financial supporter of the show you can find the links in the show notes and you can always write to us at the thick radio at gmail.com so until next time bye fats bye fats bye fatties let's talk about it Thick Radio is a Patreon and Anchor app podcast produced by Stan and Thicky Mouse. Next time, Master by Stan. Our artwork is provided by Lucky Two. Our theme song is provided by Body by Cream.